up to the Bullshift News, the Home of the Mavs Star Observatory. Guys, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an update as to what's been going on here at the Mavs Star Observatory. Obviously, what you're looking at is silicon multipliers, and this is the very sensor that is at the heart of our muon detectors. This is what does all the work for us, um, detects very, very low levels of light. Uh, we've ordered three of these because they're very expensive. Like, you know, this project like, was said that you could build these things for like $100 each. It's, it's not going to be the case because simply I've just paid for one of these SIPMs or these silicon multi or photo uh, multipliers, uh, 88 pounds each sterling, guys. That's how dear this one component is. And then the cingulate, which is a crystal block that goes on top of these, 30 pounds each. Um, so I'll put an order in for three of these as well. Uh, you know, guys, already with the PCBs and a few other components like silica optical gel and stuff like that, we're at a thousand pounds just on this project already spent. And we haven't got one of these devices finished yet. And that's because there is, like I mentioned, a great big shopping list of, um, you know, components to buy and purchase to put together. But there's a lot of other things that are going on behind the scenes, like, you know, uh, making sure that I've got the programs. Now, there's two programs for these muon detectors. One is a program that allows the LED to run or the OLED um, so that we get the information on the screen. The other one is to do with the SD uh, card reader, so the data that it collects uh, goes onto the SD card reader and we can process that data. It's obviously nice to have the data come out in a format that you can put into your spreadsheets and process and charts. And of course, I'm going to um, uh, put that in an, in an order uh, that I like to get it so that I can quickly chop off the bits I don't want, put it into Excel, and then get it processed into a chart so that we can see how that looks. So, quite a bit of stuff going on. And, and we just, uh, as you know, guys, just doing things on the um, muon detectors so that we can find out how much cosmic radiation is actually inbound. We're still uh, on the back burner, but still ordering parts and waiting for parts to come to finish the uh, play chamber. I've just put an order in for another 12 Peltiers, and we're looking still for um, a power pack to run. In total, 18 healthier elements so that we can get our temperatures down now i've done a few other uh, tests with the clay chamber and we're getting down to minus 36 now i'm quite happy with that but i did set myself the goal of getting that minus 40 or more and i believe once we add the other arrays of peltiers we'll be there guys so things are moving but gradually what took up most of the day was finding a supplier of the sipums because it is the uh, most important component in the muon detector and it has to be put together correctly guys i didn't want to cut any corners and uh, one of the methods uh, which uh, the guy at mit spencer uh, showed us of polishing the um, singular which is the crystal block was to use a blowtorch on it and the guy that i purchased off doesn't recommend that he does a lot of atomic uh, singular material and he said no if you want better results he says it has to be polished in a bit more of a professional manner than that he said the way we cut the singular here is with a high pressure water uh, jet so you get a better finish down the sides and he said we polish them properly so the problem is once you've heated up singular you do um, destroy some of its properties as a crystal and you know you want a bit better finish if you want good results then you've got to do it right by him unfortunately you know he'd, he'd convinced me then that he was the guy i've got to buy these off because that is the method in which he cuts his singular crystals so that's where we are with that we've ordered three of those um so guys yeah you know we're moving along with this project now obviously the title of this video is the latest location at the magnetic north pole so we're going to get into that but before we do you know guys we wouldn't have been able to spend a thousand pound on the materials that we've got right now and as you can see this project i said would probably be around about two thousand pounds it's going to probably be over budget just like everything else is these days i, I don't know why it is why do I, I always say things are going to be less and then they end up being more it seems to be something that's common with any of these things i think it's just simply development that's all it is um i can't do nothing about the extra time that i'm going to put in because i want to change the program well obviously 
do realise why Spencer split the programme into two parts, one for the OLED and one for the uh, SD card reader, and that was because the um, Arduinos don't have a very large capacity of memory. And I think off the top of my head, they only run at around about 16 hertz. So they're not very fast processors either. And I think that's, looking at some of the uh, circuitry, that's why it's been designed the way it has. Um, it's very difficult, uh, if I understand correctly, how, how he's gone about the process of manufacturing these boards. And I don't want to bore too many of you too much about it, but he did it in a fashion so that the 16 megahertz processor could angle it. And to do that, he had to have a peak hold to the signal, he had to have a DC-DC uh, voltage booster, and it had to hold the signal for a little bit longer than it actually passes through there very quickly in order to get the processor to pick it up at that end. So it went right, that's why he did it that way. But there might be something we can do about that, probably by... Um, at a later date, we're going to do it the way he's built it because we know that it works, it's tried and tested, but at a later date I might try some an Arduino with a little bit faster processor, perhaps a Tinsy or something on there, and uh, that might give us better results, but we might have to change a few of the programs, but what it will allow us to do is run OLEDs and SD cards at the same time, so that's something that we'll do for a later date. Okay, so big thanks to you guys that have been supporting the observatory because we wouldn't have magnetometers, we wouldn't have the uh, TriMag system, which allows us to tell you where the magnetic north pole is. We wouldn't know what condition our magnetosphere has been in for the last 15 months. And so, you know, this is all about, you know, you guys supporting what we do at the observatory. And in turn, you know, cutting it right down to the nitty gritty, you ask a question, we go to set ourselves to answer that question, we built some equipment, we get the answer. It's what we did with the magnetic north pole. It's what we did with the uh, magnetosphere sensor. That's what we're going to do with the amount of cosmic radiation, which is at its highest right now. And if we continue to get grand solar minimums, it's going to go even more. If the magnetosphere does start to decline, more cosmic radiations are inbound, and we need to know the answer to the question, how much radiation is inbound right now and if it's at high levels what risks do we have at those levels so that's the question what we're trying to answer right now with these muon detectors but in order to get to the answer we need to build them and we need to get them out into the field and you know you guys have the vehicle which is us at mass star observatory to do that for you all is we need is for you to work with us and help us fund it that's it at this point that's all we need to do. So big thanks to you guys that are supporting it. And there are only a few. Um, a big thanks to Scott today. Uh, yeah, come in, mate, by the way. Uh, great stuff. And, um, you know, let's move on. Let's find out where our magnetic north pole is. I will say this, guys, before I get onto the magnetic pole. I deliver everything I promise. Sometimes it takes time, and I can't help that. You know, I can't help the fact that, you know, I didn't have 100,000 or 200,000 pounds to bring the development of the TriMag system, and I had to teach myself the electronics and the process of programming and all that. But I delivered. And, you know, once we got to the level of programming and assembling some electronics, we was able then to build the magnetosphere sensor. And then... You know, these magnetometers that have gone around the world. And shortly we'll have the muon detectors, but I am going to let you guys down on one thing, and I think you'll understand it completely. I did say that I was going to try and put at least one of these muon detectors in a flight case for a trip that I'm going on. And my partner said to me, Gene, do you realise the particular country that we're going in, that could be seen as you know, potentially uh, the wrong thing to put in your flight case. Even though it's completely harmless, but if they start to look into it a little bit more, you know, you start mentioning radiation detection, and all of a sudden, you know, they're not going to grant you the visa to go in the country, and you're going to ruin our honeymoon, <laughs> and I'm not going to be happy with you. <laughs> and your parents are going to be happy with you because they paid for it. So, you know... I'm going to have to let you down on that, guys. If I was going to another country, um, somewhere like the United States or Canada or even Australia, I, I would be confident that, you know, you could you could explain it 
to them and they would see that it was harmless. You know, mobile phone poses more of a threat than these neon detectors in the flight bag. But in a country where I don't speak the language and it's very difficult, and, you know, I, I just think you'll, you'll understand, guys, that, you know, this time round, I, I don't want to ruin our honeymoon. I don't want to upset my parents. You know, I just want to keep everything nice and sweet and quiet. But, you know, yeah, maybe at a late date, I'll get another opportunity, um, you know, to put one of these in the flight bag and we'll get over there. But we do know that at 40,000 feet, you know, for a duration of time, the radiation is at a higher level. And, you know, it would be nice for us to confirm that. And we will do it at a later date. But I'm just sorry, guys. I've got to let you down just this once. But I'll make it up, I promise. So, okay, let's get on to where the magnetic north pole is and we'll wrap it up, okay? So let's do it. Okay, guys, I apologise for the audio levels of this video up until this point. Hopefully they're a little bit more bearable. Uh, but I suppose that just gives you an indication that, you know, what we're doing here is just live and real as opposed to uh, artificial environment that I'd be in and I'd have someone turning around to me and telling me you've got the... You know the audio levels are terrible. I'll tell you what the problem is: is that I forgot to put the plug the USB lead in. Can you believe that into the PC? And it's picking up from the mic that's on the laptop at the moment. So that's why they're bad. But let's move on. You want to know where the magnetic north pole is and how far it's migrated in just a month or thereabouts? Give a few days either here or there because it was on the 19th of June. Uh, we did this last. We're now on the 21st of August and the total migration easterly still towards Siberia guys is constant um, a little bit less than it was the last month but nevertheless not far away it's 3.9 miles total migration since the last time we give you the latest um, and of course you'll want the uh, longitude and latitude of that so it's 84.04 by 00 north by 128.42 by 31 east so there's your longitude and latitude you can go on google earth if you're following us and you're putting your pins in uh, you've got your uh, you can you've got your coordinates there you can go and plot it in so a total of 3.9 uh, miles guys interesting a little bit less than last month but nevertheless still tracking easterly towards siberia and moving to that all-important um, point on our map which is 40 degrees now somebody said to me the last time can you just zoom out the map so that we can have a look at all the other points on there well you know there's no problem there we can see all the other points coming in we can see 40 degrees there appearing on the right uh, if we continue tracking out you can see all the other dates and pins that we've put in uh, don't pay too much attention really to the uh, vertical lines that are blue, pink and red there and black and the, the horizontal ones, um, I think you gathered uh, what those are and if I just zoom in so you can see how much migration has been going on over the years and the acceleration of those, you'll be able to work it out from that and that's where it originated back in the 1900s when it very first began to accelerate. We know for the next 90 years it had covered 500 miles and then 30 miles after 1990 it covers over a thousand miles. So it's an indication clearly that things are accelerating. We predict when it gets to that 40 degrees mark uh, they, the poles are no longer in their strong field lines, they enter the weak field lines and then we get the migration taking place and you can see from the last mark that we've just entered that we're inching closer every month to that mark and that gives us our predicted period of about four to seven years especially when we look at the updated model that's coming from NOAA um, on you know the uh, magnetism of the earth right now we can see that there's been in the last seven years a massive depletion over the uh, Canadian pole and that's continuing you know this earth it hasn't stopped like some people think you know this pole hasn't stopped migrating hasn't stopped moving easterly it's still going guys and you know we'll continue tracking it we've got probably about four years at this current rate before it hits 40 degrees mark and i would predict when it does enter that region of 40 degrees is about another 300 miles or so um you know we're going to start to see depletion of the magnetosphere and of course we've got the equipment to monitor the migration 
and we've also got the equipment to monitor um, the magnetosphere strength if it should start to decline around that mark I expect to see that guys because if you've been following us for the last five months you'll have known that you know the poles are starting to wander by 200 miles westerly for some re reason uh, but gradually creeping you, you see what happens when we look at the data you can go and have a look on the TriMag data on the Pole Shift News what you'll see is it's always now maintaining around 13 degrees on our chart which tells us that since we've been recording there's been a 3 degree movement and every degree represents around about 47 miles so we know that it's constantly moving because it's constantly going up, creeping up and you know if it continues to do that and there's no reason why it shouldn't you know then we know it's actually moving easterly it's moving towards siberia and we're getting close to that 40 degree mark where they're going to enter them weak field lines what will be uh the scenario when obviously we do reach that weak field lines and the pole begins to reverse at that point is new uncharted territory we do know and expect the uh, magnetosphere to, to plunder at that point and get a lot weaker. And by then, guys, hopefully we'll have plenty of these muon detectors in the field allowing us to know where on this Earth we have protection from cosmic radiation and where we don't have protection or if we have very low levels of protection. And, you know, that's well worth uh, supporting somebody, you know, with an observatory like this, I think. And you know, if you want to do that, I'm going to mention the link once. It's down there. You can support us on Patreon, and you can support us with a one-off payment on PayPal. But what is important, guys, is that we get these uh, muon detectors out into the field now, so that we can collect, you know, that information with relationship to how much radiation is inbound. The only way we can do it is by getting funded, and it's as simple as that. So there's no need for me to go on any more, guys. You've had a heads up on the muon detectors on the cloud chamber. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, we done the SD cards on the TriMag and the magnetosphere sensor. I'm waiting for some data uh, to come in shortly, hopefully, from uh, South California. And, uh, you know, hopefully within the next week, our magnetometers will arrive in Perth. I know Jeff has took his... Uh, magnetometer now out of his property and he's took it 15 miles sorry 1500 miles north of Australia to get a reading there for a week and we'll have the results of that as well as you know we'll have a new magnetometer out in Perth and one in the Gold Coast as well and we'll be picking up data again from Australia so you know we're still working on what what it is that's causing that strange uh, anomaly to occur with Jeff's magnetometer and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of that very soon and uh, you guys will be informed as soon as we do. So there's a lot going on, guys. So, you know, all is we need right now is to get these muon det detectors built and put out in the field and we can collect data on the uh, actual cosmic radiation that's inbound at several locations at the same time on our Earth. So, as always, guys, you have an amazing week and I'll catch up with you very, very soon. And as always, bye for now.